Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to today's continuity community on developing final assessments. Uh, this is a topic that has been increasingly uh, common for us to be asked about. And so we are uh, here to work through some of the common issues that faculty are bringing to us and that the uh, literature speaks to and that many uh, faculty are working very creatively, very hard to uh, come up with clever solutions that we also will share with you. So with that, oh, I will introduce myself. I'm Megan Bathgate. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Educational Program Assessment at the Corbu Center. And I am presenting today with my colleague, Kyle Vitali, who is here and waving uh, in the green shirt. Uh, Kyle's the Assistant Director of the Faculty Teaching Initiative team, uh, also at the Corbu Center. So we work closely together on these ideas all the time. So we are excited to uh, present some of these uh, ideas and have this conversation with you. And we'd like to get to know you a bit more. So if you could take the time to use the chat to enter your name, your department, and what you're hoping to achieve out of today's session, that'd be great. Uh, I recognize that you're all here to learn about uh, developing final assessments. So you can be very specific uh, in what you're hoping to achieve. If you want to say uh, the type of um, exam you're looking to amend, or um, maybe a concern that you have or a desire, it's all game. And I see many, many Porbu uh, folks here. So thank you all for coming. And uh, all of the instructors here know that you have lots of support today. Michael, I see you're uh, thinking about how to change a final exam, thinking about one-on-one uh, -on -one oral exams, which is an approach that we've seen happening. Mm -hmm. Christy's here for Canvas support. Ah, Michael, yes, <laughs> the pass uh, fail and students um, taking the finals. Stephanie, I see you've adapted your final paper and wanna know what other people are doing, how to navigate universal pass. Mm -hmm. Large class, yes, hi, Christine. Yes. So again, lots of Corbu people um, thinking about uh, how we can help with the tools and techniques that we have. Uh, I see others uh, from different disciplines. We have a great uh, interdisciplinary crowd, which is wonderful. Ah, yes. Hard to correct by the instructor <laughs> uh, and targets particular objectives. Yes, we will talk about that. Um, yes, correction, size of class, uh, all of these things are important uh, context for what we're going to choose for final exams. So uh, thank you, everyone. I see a couple other people coming. Um, yes. Right. This idea of aug augmenting traditional final paper exams or um, even multiple choice exams. So the idea that this isn't all or nothing is something that we'll talk about as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on uh, the goals that we have for today. And as we go through, if there are remaining questions at the end and you don't feel like you've, we've quite addressed uh, what you've come here for today, we will have some time uh, to think about your specific uh, context and questions. So we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, and we are here to help troubleshoot with you and then also uh, seeing the creative solutions that your peers have come up with uh, is also helpful. And I see questions about different time zone exams. Yes, that's come up a couple times for us as well. Okay, so uh, the goals for today are really to learn about strategies to assess student learning in emergency remote teaching, to discuss creative solutions for common challenges for uh, final assessments faced in this type of context, and consider resources available through the Poor Group Center. Um, I just want to pause for a second and, and note kind of the, the strategic wording of emergency remote teaching uh, that we use here. Um, so it's tempting to think of this as just online education, but it is a twist, right, in what we intended this, court, uh, this semester to look like. Uh, and so it takes a certain kind of transition and adaptation that is not typical for online learning and the history of the pedagogical development that's happened through online education. And so I just wanna note that 
that raises particular challenges um, for instructors to think about how to transition. So not just to move online, but to move online in a pandemic mid-semester. So just a little context to remember kind of the boat that we're all in right now. So there's been a bit of a push on uh, being sure that we are articulating this difference and that our students understand this difference. And so there's a couple of great resources. This is just one that came out uh, recently about the difference between online learning and um, kind of this emergency remote teaching. And so I'm just putting that here. I'll include it in the follow-ups too, to think about how you are transitioning now versus how you could intentionally build a course uh, that should we ever need to do this again, could be an easier transition for you and your students. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, some guiding considerations for us. Uh, I'm going to just ask, what is the point of assessment? <laughs> you don't need to answer, but it's something that I want you to think about as we go through this conversation. Uh, really, it can be tempting to think about what you're going to test on, to really think about what content you've covered and what you want your students to know and walk away with. Um, I would challenge you to think about really student-centered assessment and not really test-centered assessment. So rather than thinking about what you want to cover, think about what you want students to walk away with. Because although these are your finals in this course, the student continues on, right? Using this knowledge, bumping into other concepts as they go. And so really think about this as an opportunity for feedback for students to carry forward these ideas as they go and pursue their next steps. Um, so just a reminder, as, as you're going through and making these choices to consider uh, this question of what's the point and what's the point for you and what's the point for your students. And just remember, um, as you make your selections to kind of have that be the foundation. So this may be familiar to those of you if, if you attended uh, our previous session on um, adjusting assessments. Uh, in our continuity community, I think late last month, possibly, I forget the date, time is funny right now, uh, you will recognize these. So um, the same principles that apply for assessments in general do apply here for finals. Uh, so defining the goals is, is key for students being in for yourself to make these decisions. So understanding what specific knowledge or skills you're evaluating and what is a priority right now for you and your students, knowing that this is a universal pass fail uh, context that we're working in. And so thinking about what is a priority? What do you want the key information to be that your students walk away with? Uh, and balancing that priority with the constraints of the environment that we're engaging in right now. Consider alternatives. So it can be tempting to just want to lock into what you've done because you know it, your students have expected it, your syllabus is created in that way. I understand that. And that might be the way to go. But I encourage you just to, to back up for a second and think about, well, what if? What if I switched it? What would the consequence of that be? So be open um, as we go through. A lot of the things that we're going to be covering today are um, suggestions that can be amended depending on what you uh, would like to do with your students. And uh, be as clear as possible. So although the grade-related anxiety is not as strong with the universal pass-fail, um, there still is quite a bit of anxiety um, for students and for yourselves, I'm sure, as instructors and just people in the world right now. Um, so clarity around what you expect from your students, around what they can expect from you, um, and a timeline is really helpful right now. So just general principles for us to consider. Uh, and related to that, I've been attending some of the um, national communities on uh, assessment in higher education right now and seeing what they're doing and how this conversation is going. And one of the big themes that has been coming up is this importance on compassion over compliance right now. Um, it can be very tempting to just want to make this like it was, right? Want to make this exactly like it would have been. Um, the reality is that it's a pretty tense situation right now and to kind of view this with a lens of compassion um, that gives honor for what your students have done in the classroom to this point and for what you've done um, as instructors and for yourself as far as thinking about your own time in developing this course and your own time that you have right now to do the kind of grading and assessment and work that you want to do for this course. So just encouraging you to have that compassion for you and yourselves and your students. Okay, 
So moving on to some more concrete uh, information, the way that I'm going to, uh, that Kyle and I actually are going to present the next few um, slides is to take a lens of what you'd expect to run in the classroom coming into uh, the semester and running through some alternatives to that. Some of the conversations that we've heard around um, the benefits and costs associated with that alternative um, approach, and then some suggestions that we have about how you can think about implementing these alternatives in a functional way in your classroom. So the first one that we're going to cover is this, this timed closed book exam. This is um, a common one that people have been asking us about what do I do if I was intending to do a timed exam, closed book, and students are everywhere at all different time zones, what do I do? Um, so we're gonna show some alternatives, and I wanna stress that these are not mutually exclusive. Um, all of these alternatives can be kind of mashed together, taken apart, uh, it's kind of choose your own adventure a little bit here. Um, and we have considerations related to those and again, suggestions. So I'm gonna start with something uh, that you may, hope, well, hopefully, I think probably a lot of you at this point are, are pretty friendly with Canvas. You may be sick of Canvas, I'm not sure, but uh, it is there and it is pretty powerful. Um, so some of the things that are available on Canvas are um, less commonly used in a face-to-face -face interaction, but they're there and especially powerful for this remote learning situation. So I wanna just go through a couple things about that. Um, here we go. Uh, so the first, when I, when I talk about using Canvas quizzes or Canvas, Canvas assignments, some of the considerations that faculty immediately raise are, well, students, could they share exams? Can they look up answers? Can they Google answers? Can they use their phones? Can they use their open notebooks? Um, how do I control for that? Uh, and that is a concern, right? So if, if you are concerned about that kind of um, compliance to the academic integrity of, of the work, we want to think that through and think about what might be best. Um, so I want to say within Canvas, you can do things like time uh, your exam. You can allow it to be open for a particular window of time. Um, and you can give students different amounts of time to complete it. So if um, you're running a one hour exam, you can give everyone a one hour window to do that within a four hour window, for example. So the exam could be open for four hours. And when one student comes in, that student now gets an hour to complete that. So there are ways to kind of mess with the timing to help um, uh, streamline some of that process. And then you can also allow um, students to have additional time should they need it. So if you have a student that needs an accommodation and they get time and a half, for example, you can do that all within Canvas um, and moderate it in that way. So that's something to consider. We can talk a little bit more about that um, if people have questions. And we have a lot of tutorials and step-by-step -step visualizations for how to do that um, if you're interested. And people here who are stellar at um, doing that. So more to come if you're interested. Um, and the other piece that, that we hear a lot about is the quantitative exams needing particular adjustments. So if you're working with equations or models um, that you need to kind of interact with, that's a challenge in this remote uh, environment. So what do you do? Here's a few suggestions uh, to consider. So the big one that I want you to, to walk away with is the more rationale you ask for from students, the harder it is to replicate that. So if you ask students to explain their thinking, if you ask them to apply something, to, to contrast between two cases, for example, you are kind of boosting the amount of uh, thinking that they need to do to get out that answer. So it, it makes it uh, harder to Google. It makes it harder to, to quickly look up in their uh, notes. It makes it harder to just, you know, text a friend or whatever else might be happening. Um, really thinking through how to uh, help them demonstrate their learning, because that's really the point, right? So not just to catch them, <laughs> right? And, and doing something that is not within the honor code that you've set up, but really to think about how can you let them demonstrate their thinking to you? So that's, that's one big one that goes kind of for all of this uh, approach is, is really the more you can increase what you're requesting from the students, the less uh, it's likely that they could at least easily um, do anything that would be uh, less than desirable for, for the uh, course. The other thing that I wanna encourage you to think about is developing question banks. Um, so if you use quizzes or uh, assignments in Canvas, 
um, and have a question bank that you can work from. Uh, this will help you this semester, but also thinking forward, if this is something that, you know, does need to be extended, this kind of social distancing, whether it's, you know, in the fall or at another time, if there's another wave of this, um, investing now and developing some of those items is not lost. Um, you can kind of recoup that time if you do need to use it again. And you might want to, um, especially if you are concerned about exams kind of floating around the internet or anything, having these question banks can actually help you um, uh, have something in your pocket that you can use again in different ways. Uh, and they don't have to be huge changes. So I've seen some faculty do things where um, they just reverse the item in a way. So if you ask them, uh, students with, the, with something that is, uh, you know, what is the most likely scenario based on these factors? And you present that versus what is the least likely in these factors. So you can use, you can kind of play with the same theme with slight wording differences, or you can do completely different items that tap the same topic, um, kind of dependent on how much effort you want to put in and how you want to shape your exam. Uh, we also have honor code language, uh, which goes a long way. I, I know it's not perfect. You're asking, it is an honor code. <laughs> You're asking students to uh, obey it, uh, but just giving them that trust and using that language with them and setting clear expectations for them and with them uh, is something that does set a tone in your class. And so we have language for that on the website that we're happy to share if you're interested. Um, the other note that I want to talk about here is the, the heavy equation use. So if you're asking, um, this comes up in chemistry in uh, stats courses, for example, uh, where people are actually doing um, models, equations, long problem sets, Canvas isn't always easy to, to work with in that way. So there's a few ways that, that we've found successful and that other faculty have found successful in um, mitigating some of those challenges. One is you can use Canvas assignments to have students upload their work. So you can have them take a picture and upload it. It's less than ideal. The picture might not be great quality, um, but it's a way for them to bring that to the um, into the uh, canvas set, in, into the canvas so that you can uh, share that with them. And Christine, I see that you would like the honor code language. I'm happy to share that um, in just a minute. Uh, so the other uh, piece that we've seen be helpful is to instead of asking students to generate the um, problems, I'm sorry, instead of asking students to uh, answer the problems in a uh, kind of handwritten way. Another way to do this is for you as the instructor to develop the model or an equation and potentially introduce some kind of error in it or some kind of um, model that's incomplete. And in doing so, you ask the student, what is incomplete about this model? What would the consequence of this be? What would you do to correct it or finish it, for example? And so this is a way for us to really think about um, using uh, creative ways to solve some of the challenges about how students can demonstrate their learning without having to produce something that's handwritten, for example. Um, another way to do this is for students to generate rationale, uh, I'm sorry, generate questions with rationale. So if you present a topic that you would like to cover in an exam and you ask students, what would you ask about this? What do you think is important about this topic? Why would we ask about this topic? Um, and have them develop a test question for their peers and their peers don't have to take it. This can just be their, their uh, effort and have them explain what the item is, why it's important, um, what the correct answer is, why that's the correct answer, and possibly even walk through some of the alternatives um, can show a real depth of knowledge that students have as they're grasping a concept. Um, you know, to, to be able to teach something is a good way to demonstrate your knowledge of it. And so uh, thinking about whether that fits for your class and their level of understanding of the concept um, may be helpful as well. So those are just three examples of how we've seen some of the more equation heavy courses um, deal with some of these uh, constraints of remote learning. And thanks to Beth for uploading the uh, honor language into the chat. So the other option that we've increasingly been seeing is that people are going to open up their their closed book exams they're kind of embracing and leaning in to the idea that uh this is not going to be um perfect and things may be shared and things may be um resourced across uh people or online or their notes so this comes into play where uh 
equity is concerned. So one thing that comes up is some students brought their notebooks with them and some didn't, for example, uh, we've been hearing. So some people are going to have a lot of things to pull from, others are not. Um, and so to think about opening up your exam actually says, you know what, do what you can with what you have, lean on each other potentially, collaborate with others who may have resources that you need. Um, the fear here, I think, is, is in part due to the idea that students may copy without learning. So they may um, just look up the answers and write it down and not really embed that knowledge in their minds. And so the way that we would suggest really thinking about solving these problems is in addition to some of the suggestions above, is provide really clear guidelines of what you expect, what resources, again, kind of honor code, what resources you intend for them to use, what's off limits, what's not, um, and frame for them that this really actually mimics the authenticity of research. Um, you know, if I'm writing an article, I certainly don't not consult <laughs> people or friends or, or um, resources online. And so thinking about asking them a question that isn't just a, a definitional question, but really a, an example of them providing some kind of application or transferring their knowledge to a new setting can really help them ask hard questions where they would need their resources and potentially each other to solve those problems. Another way to think about this is to have students organize um, their, oops, oop, organize their uh, knowledge in new ways. So um, asking them to either create an argument uh, uh, to contrast different cases, for example, uh, to develop a concept map, which we can talk more about if people are interested in that. Uh, basically asking students to demonstrate how they think about the things in your course and how they see relationships among the content can demonstrate a layer of depth and knowledge and understanding that can meet some of the uh, goals of a timed closed book exam. It's just a spin on the same content. So a couple things to consider. And then within this, um, you can allow collaboration or ask for it not to be there. So uh, you can't guarantee they're not gonna collaborate, but certainly it's, it's something that you can make explicit. Um, there are, I will say, if you choose to use Canvas, um, there are ways to um, you know, block browsers and things of that nature, which we're seeing less of uh, specifically with the uh, universal pass fail ruling. People seem to have, have lessened in, in those requests, at least from my end, others can speak to that if they have not seen that. Um, but it's there, <laughs> it's an option. Uh, if you wanna learn more about that, we can talk about that as well. And then I see a question about um, rubrics. Yes, to increase rationale, yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that question a lot. So if some of the adjustments that we've talked about here are um, require a bit of work on your part. It's not, it's not kind of at no cost for you. So thinking about how you'd like to um, come up with the kind of criteria that you would like to see in rationale would be very helpful, not just for yourself as you're grading, but for your students to know what you're really wanting from them. Um, so the kinds of rubrics, rubrics that um, we would suggest, uh, we have a little bit of, of um, information on the website of this, but one thing that might be helpful is to really sit down with the content that you're looking to um, revise. Think about the goals, think about the skills that you are hoping students to de develop through um, the course, and think about what is the criteria that you would, ah, Kyle, thank you. What is the criteria that you would like students to meet in order to demonstrate that they have met that goal? It sounds super vague because it kind of has to be unless I know your content. So, so one thing that we can do is, um, Rosa Maria, if you want to, uh, at the uh, Q&A section, ask, give us a little more information about what kind of course uh, you're doing. We can talk a little bit more about how rubrics might be able to be tailored in your case. Happy to talk about that. And we also are all available for one-on-one um, -on -one consults as well. Okay. Um, last thing on this slide I want to just mention, another way to, to uh, think about um, adjusting. Uh, this is kind of a bigger adjustment in um, timed closed book kinds of formats, and this can actually be applied to, to others as well, is this annotated portfolio. So this is an idea that students are um, developing, or really collating, putting together all of the work that they've done in the course, 
and narrating it, demonstrating how their knowledge has changed, maybe going back to old work that th that was incorrect and explaining what they were thinking, how their thinking has changed, what the correct answer is, why it's there, and really using metacognition and, and reinforcing what they've learned in order to create a, a, a broad scope of how that student's individual development around this course content has progressed over the over this uh, full semester or longer, depending on what uh, how you've been working with them. Um, this does prioritize prior content. So um, if you have no assessment uh, between maybe mid semester and now, this does have that, uh, it will prioritize what they've already done. If you've been having small assessments as you're going, then you have the opportunity to kind of look across the full semester. Um, and it does take longer to grade. So if you're looking for something that is automatic and uh, able to just kind of be processed, this does take a little more effort. Um, and so I would think about that in addition to the rubric, when you're asking for more rationale from students, that often does come with a different kind of grading. And so thinking really cleanly about what you would like to measure, whether you have TFs, whether you have access to people who can help you with grading. Uh, there's also some resources such as Gradescope, which help to, um, uh, it's a Canvas plugin, is, is Gradescope, and it helps to automate some of the grading of open-ended items. It's a terrific tool. So we will put um, a link for that in somewhere, and we can talk more about that if people are interested. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Kyle to talk about some of uh, the written um, assignments and, and adaptations there. Great. Thanks, Megan, so much. Uh, and we encourage people to keep asking questions and being active in the chat window so far as that would be helpful to you. Uh, so uh, the bulk of my consultations with faculty the last month have been in the humanities. That's my background in Shakespeare and writing. Uh, so I'm here to represent and chat a bit about how to pivot the traditional written assignments that are often in the humanities and some of the social sciences, the research papers, the reflective papers, things like that. Uh, the experience in the humanities is likely to be as uneven as in the sciences in that some of the assignments that students are often given at the end of a semester in a literature or a, or a history course, uh, some of those don't really get impacted much by going remote because you're doing close readings of texts, you are uh, providing research papers that are available with material online. Uh, in some cases, you might be particularly frozen. Students don't have access to the archival material that they've been working with at the Beinecke or the Lewis Walpole Library. Uh, you are focused up heavily on group work and in class discussions that are, are, are more difficult as well. So I just wanted to put that out there, that some of you may be experiencing things unevenly. And what we share now is uh, representative. But we're very, very happy to take specific questions. We'd rather have a highly specific question because chances are others are experiencing that as well. So anyway, uh, to start, the, the number one uh, piece of uh, object that, that we can zero down on is the, the research paper. The traditional, go find your, your 10 sources, 20 sources, whatever it might be, and write a paper. Uh, one of the most basic pieces of advice I've been administering lately is just to simply revise that assignment. Uh, offering a revised version of the research paper largely still allows students to engage in the research process, to synthesize sources, to sort out where their claims and their original voice is in the balance with the resources and the essays that they're reading. Uh, totally possible in the current setting. Several considerations that are uh, some maybe more or less obvious. Of course, there's an equity of resources issue. Uh, depending on students' access to internet and to high-speed internet, going online and looking for alternative resources might be difficult. Uh, some students may have more or less success with the VPN going into the, the firewall into Yale's Orbis and library databases. So being cognizant that any revised assignment that still requires students to do a fair bit of work uh, on their own needs to be aware of what students even can even can do. Uh, equity in this type of scenario does not necessarily mean everybody does the same thing. You might need to be thinking about what are uh, similar commitments or similar amounts of time or different ways to employ the same skill sets. What might those look like to ensure that every student is at least having an equitable experience in terms of the skill sets they have walking out of the course. Uh, in a lot of ways, a revised research paper is going to look like 
students looking for public facing materials or materials they can get on Google Scholar, they can still find through the Orbis firewall. This may require a different set of texts that they have to go in and read. I saw one piece of advice or one example over in the chat a little bit early on. Uh, let's see, that was from Stephanie, who's adapted her final paper, shortened the length, Stephanie Redden. Uh, this is a great way to do this. Simply reducing the number of total sources a student needs to cite to and even length can be really, really helpful because students still get the experience of finding a source, evaluating it, synthesizing it with other sources, uh, but simply not having to spend as much time on that and able to spend more time on the writing itself. Uh, a great additional benefit to maintaining the current research assignment, but just revising it by shortening it or changing the 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 kind of research that you're undergoing is you can also give students a bit more time to read each other's work uh, if they're spending less time on their own on their computer digging into databases and more time reading each other's draft assignments they're also exploring that other essential property of writing which is submitting your writing to somebody else uh, to get their feedback on it uh, so you might continue, continue to think about what peer-reviewed work looks like in, in a revised research paper. If you already have a peer-reviewed step, you might enlarge it and do more with that assignment as well. Again, something that doesn't get impacted too heavily in the remote setting. Uh, you'll see some suggestions on the right there. We have things like collating online resources. If you feel like it would be more equitable for you uh, as the expert to go out and spend an afternoon pulling in a, just a ton of stuff that students can draw from, that might be a way to ensure equity that students all get the same materials to be working with. Uh, this can also alternatively be something that students do. You might ask them to contribute to a core online bibliography for the course. Uh, either annotated or not. So students get some experience putting a bibliography together uh, and evaluating each other's findings. A, a, a more extreme revision might simply be changing the format. And this is a common theme <clears throat> that you've heard from Megan already and will continue to hear from me. You might think about a different written format for the, the paper, something that a student might find themselves actually doing in the real world via white paper or a report, a uh, news article, blog, an interview format. You might also consider something like an oral or visual essay if students feel compelled to fully embrace the, the Zoom dynamic and being online and doing something that's a bit more visually oriented and that has some intellectual cohesion but is more driven by performativity, you might consider that as well. Uh, and then considering and assessing length and role of, of your feedback. What kind of feedback, given your relationship with your students, is most helpful at this moment? Is that one-on-one -on -one Zoom conversations where you talk out your student's paper or assignment? Is it written feedback in, in, in the margins and sort of head notes and footnotes the way that, the way that humanists often do when, when correcting essays and sending those back, that might still work for you as well. But consider how students might benefit from a revised way of assessing this, this assignment. Uh, a, a, a completely different direction is to embrace self-reflection a bit more. This kind of advice started to come out of my conversations with faculty who are struggling with access to archives. And in conversation, what we came to realize was, well, right now your students who were going to the Beinecke or were going into one of the material object museums on campus to do some work are suddenly unable to do that. Well, there are others in the community who don't have access to those materials even when campus is fully in session uh, in, in what we consider to be a normal season. There's always a question of access to materials and to collections on a university campus and off of one, uh, it might be worth considering what are the material restrictions now to your, to your students' intellectual work and to their assignments that might be worth their reflecting upon and learning something a bit about uh, scholarly work. What is it like to not have access 
to a special collection because you don't have the money to travel to Washington, D.C., or because you uh, don't have a formal teaching or a contract with the university and a collection doesn't permit independent scholars, something like that. Uh, in, in their own way and in the particulars of your particular setting, what could students reflect upon materially that's altered in the class and might be helpful to them? Uh, there is a lot of room for self-reflection as scholars as well. If a research assignment is just not going to work for you or can only work in a very, very small increment, how can you ask students to reflect on the development of their writing over time, the development of their thinking about a particular idea, uh, even their development as learners? What are they noticing are their strengths and weaknesses as we move to this remote setting? What are they better at remotely? What are they worse at? What are, how are they seeing your course materials anew? Uh, how are they seeing class discussion itself anew? There are lots of opportunities to help them think about themselves as learners in this time. And although it's possible to ask them to reflect on their writing voices or archival access in a normal semester, the pressures, anxieties, and realities of the current situation just bring a lot at home for them in new ways. So the, the, the pressure of the situation might eke out some reflection that you might not get otherwise. So we ask you to consider that as well. Obviously, uh, something like this alters content. You're not testing or assessing on the merits of the knowledge of the material as much anymore. I would urge you to consider that, especially in the humanities course or in the courses that are focused on a lot of writing, there's always more material that they can write and think about than the particulars of your course content. Uh, we do ask you and advise you to think about your students' current and future goals. Uh, ask them to ponder what kinds of objects might they engage with or consider that their future careers might have them create down the road and have them pitch that to you. Uh, we ask you to provide structure with, with these choices. That goes back to our conversation about rubrics uh, in, in Megan's prior section having some kind of uniformity equity what are the skill sets what is the length of time students should spend on these assignments what should that look like the more clarity you can provide the safer students will feel to make some bold choices here uh, next is something that's kind of a mixture of the first two and that's meta-analysis and what i mean by that is asking students to go back and close read or think about or critically analyze their own writing, their own projects and assignments from the first half of class, and or return to material that you already covered in the first half of class and ask students how their perspectives have changed upon it. Uh, in the types of courses that I've been consulting on, the survey courses, the topics-based courses, the goal is largely to get from A to B, covering as much content as possible along the way. Perfectly fine, that, that's a way to do it. Often in those kinds of courses, students will experience or engage with a text or an idea and then not return to it. This is a great opportunity if you find yourself stymied by lack of materials or, or inequity or access to materials, to ask students to go back and ask, wow, in a month's time, how has my perspective already changed on this idea? Or on this text. Uh, this, as like we said, reinforces and extends prior efforts and helps students uh, gather a sense for how they are growing in relationship to course content and materials. If you're going to have them go back and look at their old reading logs or their old uh, rhetorical analyses or responses or lab reports or something like that, it helps them see how they've grown and develop and it helps them get some objectivity, objectivity to their own writing and to their own thought process, which can be immensely helpful to students. We, again, ask you and advise you to be transparent about your goals and what you're asking students to do here. This isn't busy work. This is giving them a chance to really, really defamiliarize themselves from themselves and see themselves anew, which is one of the hardest things with writing, uh, seeing it when you're too close to it. And again, be clear about expectations. Absolutely. Uh, Megan, please, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, the, the last item to mention here as an alternative to the written assignment, and several have mentioned this in the chat window already, is one-on-one -on -one or small group chats. 
this can be a great way to relieve students of the tyranny of the blank page and the pressures that often in, in, in hinge on writing, asking them to just explore their knowledge of the material of a course. If your course is a WR or is writing intensive and writing is part of the focus, you might have students in one-on-one -on -one or small group chats talking about their writing. The act of articulating and talking about your writing is hard and also immensely helpful because you're forced to point out and articulate for yourself, wow, I like this sentence, I don't like this sentence, rather than have it be sort of muddy and un unarticulated in your head. Uh, especially in small groups where students are seeing others talk about their writing. Can you really read a lot of real growth there? There's going to be varying levels of comfort and experience with oral exams. You also need to think about equity in terms of students' circumstances in their homes. If they're able to speak loudly and clearly and, and hear clearly as well. So being aware of that helps. Time zones are going to matter. I've, I've been helping out with a couple courses this semester with students calling in from Russia and England, and it's three o'clock in the morning in Russia. Uh, so being aware of that and either setting up assignments that don't require one of the three students in a small group to be calling in at midnight, uh, or being the person who's up at midnight so that your student across the globe is bright-eyed and ready might, might be considerations. And then class size as well. If your class is super small, uh, some group conversations might be better than a small group chat because your class is already a small group. You're going to notice the theme here in the suggestions here, clear rubric, clear theme, clear questions. Clarity is really going to matter as you revise these final assignments, helping students clearly understand what your expectations are and how the revised assignment still meets the goals of the original assignment will be important. Uh, you want to ensure that you are also articulating how much students can rely on resources and how much they can prepare ahead of time for, for instance, a one-on-one -on -one oral examination. And think as well about the extent to which you want students focusing on their writing versus on, on, on published material as well. So, uh, I'm going to move on to another kind of project that tends to appear more in performance and, and creative work, but can appear anywhere. I'm gonna move relatively quickly so we have, we have time for questions here at the end. But in addition, instead of a solo or group project sort of in front of class, you might consider synchronized presentations where students are all coming together as we are now in, in Zoom and sharing material or, or sharing, sharing their work somehow. A lot of the same considerations are going to apply here in terms of time zones, access to internet, uh, having the right device that, that can allow students to, to be present. Uh, and a lot of the same considerations that you can imagine and have already experienced in a normal semester, equal contributions, how are you grading the group versus the individual uh, efforts. Those questions don't ever go away. Uh, and they certainly haven't gone away here. So continue, continuing to think about that can, can really matter with group work and synchronized presentations as well as uh, in person and in normal semester clear rubrics how are you grading this uh the students are going to want to know that considering whether and how to use feedback uh to what extent is a presentation assessed work versus uh, a sort of final class event that continues to reinforce the social dynamics of your class and give students a different way into the material, especially with universal pass fail, where letter grades might not be as meaningful for students. Is live presentation necessary for your goals? Is it necessary? And if not, uh, Megan, thank you. Asynchronous presentations might be the way to go, not requiring students to all be present at the same time for a, uh, for a presentation or for your material. This can really help with time zone issues. This can really help if you're struggling with how to provide an equitable assessment for group work. There are going to be issues here as well. It's not live. Students can review and redo things as often as they want. So if you're uh, grading instant responsiveness or live performance, that might be an issue to think through. The community feel is gone. And uh, you might want to think about to what extent students are doing that work solo, working together outside of class, but then still presenting material asynchronously, 
How are you reviewing everyone's work in that regard? Make sure your process for feedback is clear and ensure you have ways to build that in. We also ask you to think about just revising for context generally. So synchronous versus asynchronous is one way to do things, but just thinking about who your students are, uh, online versus in-person uh, work might differ depending on the kind of work you are doing in January and February in your classes. If students have developed a cohort mentality, you might want to think about synchronous presentations. They might, even in the remote setting, really thrive and still be expecting to work together. If they have never worked together at all, if your class has been entirely uh, individualized work, making them do group work remotely over Zoom is probably not the best idea. It may have been in class. It is likely not now. If you are really, really set on doing that, we're very happy to work with you and make that happen, but really think about what your students are used to and are expecting of you. Uh, any of these assignments may require additional reading. They're gonna re require revised learning goals, making sure you're clear on that where your students can really help. Uh, we ask you to provide structure with some choice. That means two things. Uh, we would like to see more and more professors, as much as is possible, articulating your choices to your students. That helps them be on board with you. Uh, we also advise and invite you to provide some structural choices for your students, help them make choices themselves. You might offer a menu of options for a final project or ways of doing a final project that allows students to choose something that best fits their circumstances. And that can help weed out issues where you've assigned something that students simply can't complete because of their situation. Uh, and encourage students to think forward to what content will support their, their future steps. How is this current project gonna help them next semester in the summer course, in their career choices? What is best for them? So. Awesome. Uh, thanks. I will be here on Canvas, continuing to answer questions. I'll hand it back to Megan. Thanks, Kyle. That was helpful to have lots of lenses from lots of different disciplines to think through uh, how we can kind of meet these challenges. So right now we're going to open it up. Uh, what resonates for you and what we've said? Uh, are there remaining questions that you have that you'd like to bring up for your specific context? Uh, what's on your mind? So we're going to take a moment here to uh, open up the chat window. That's probably the easiest way to do it. You can also um, raise your hand if you'd like to speak. I'm just gonna make sure I can see you. Hang on one moment. Okay, yes, so either works. So feel free to use the chat or you can use the Zoom functions to raise your hand and I will uh, give, you, give you the floor. <laughs> 